101 with Mr. Burger. Scholars, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and a master educator who tries to attempt to provide you with the best in art historical content. If you like it, make sure you like, share, subscribe, comment, do all those things to interact. I greatly appreciate it. You and what army? From time to time, I like to poll the public just to get a sense of what, uh, what you all want to see. Now, I encourage you to leave a comment down below if there's something that you would like to see or like me to do some content on. Uh, but from time to time, I put out a poll. And in a recent poll, Albrecht Durer uh, was uh, tied to uh, become the topic of content. And so today, we're going to fulfill that obligation to you, the people. I'm going to create this video and, you know, not too long from now, I'll also do one on uh, Pompeii as well. But for now, let's check out Albrecht Durer. Arguably the greatest of the Northern Renaissance artists of his time, known as the Leonardo of the North, Albrecht Durer was the master of many media. He was a blend of German art traditions with the habits of the Italian masters. He would create the first self-portrait at the age of 13, and heightening self-portraits to the point of artistic tradition that continues to this day. He would create the first animal portrait that would again send traditions following his lead in that regard. And he would create the first realistic landscape drawings in color through a series of watercolor landscapes as he's traveling over the Alps in 1495 and yet again creating a tradition that would last into our modern century. This extremely intelligent individual was known as a painter, graphic artist, designer, and engraver, considered by most to be the greatest printmaker of all time. Beyond visual art, he also loved the study of mathematics, geography, and architecture. He even went so far as to write dissertations on geometry, perspective and proportion, fortification, and art theory. His art and art ideals were admired by his contemporaries, most notably Erasmus and longtime pen pal Raphael Sanzio. Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. A Hungarian immigrant to Nuremberg, Germany, Durer's father was a very exceptional goldsmith by trade, and Albrecht would train in the family craft. He became an apprentice to his father starting at the age of 11, and he was very quick to catch on, and his skill was highly noticed. In 1488, at the age of 17, he began working with Michael Vogelmann, Nuremberg's foremost painter and woodcut printer. Are you kids having a good time? Yeah! Albrecht Durer would say, Why has God given me such magnificent talent? He's definitely accurate in saying that innate abilities that we are born with are definitely talents. But the work and the time and the effort that goes into that is a building of skills that he definitely developed during the beginning years of his life as an artist and artisan. During his formal training years, Durer would move around. He traveled between Germany and Italy. When he returned home from Italy, he would bring back with him the Italian ideas of the Renaissance, the rebirth of the classic times. Now he was called home by his father, who had arranged for him to get married, which seems to have been a bit of an unhappy situation. At the age of 23, on July the 7th, 1494, Albrecht Durer would get married to Agnes Frey, the daughter of a prominent brass worker, Hans Frey. During most of his travels, he would leave his wife at home so that she could sell the prints at various fairs in Nuremberg. 
he refused to eat with his wife, and he's gone on the record saying that he hated her friends. He called her the old crow, and for some reason, they never had children, so go figure. Believe it or me, this woman is a make me nuts. Time would pass and Albert Durr would open his own studio. He was very much into his paintings and devoted the prominent amount of his time in his studio to this type of work. In 1512, the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I appointed Durr to his court of artists. And of all the artists in his court, it is said that Durr was his favorite. Side note. According to legend, he had a competition with all those folks in his court, asking them to provide Maximilian I with the greatest example of their work. And Durer showed up without any artworks. And to amaze Maximilian, he took a drawing utensil and drew a perfect circle without any aid of a stencil or compass or anything like that. And it truly did amaze Maximilian, and it said that's why Durr was his favorite. Like that stuff. Very few can argue that Durr was very high on the mountain of great artists of the German High Renaissance. A work that very much reflects his skill at that time was his self-portrait at 28. He was very much aware of his image and painted several self-portraits over his career, as we previously discussed. Why on earth would you want to be real when you can be famous? Although Albert Durr loved to paint, he was never as great of a painter as he was at printmaking. He would work in several print media including engraving, woodcut, and etching. Saying he was prolific is very much an understatement. There was an eight-year stretch between 1512 and 1520 that he was creating a very high volume of prints, and during that time period, in 1513 and 14, he created what is known as his Master Prints, a series of three 7x10 prints that were very detailed with significant iconography. Now, the subject matter is a bit all over the place in these three, but they are united in their depictions of spirituality. He wanted a series that would show the individual how to live life according to his own opinion of life living, I guess. But these three works of Master Prince were Night, Death, and the Devil from 1513, Melancholia 1 from 1514, and Saint Jerome in his study also from 1514. And this is how they're intended to be displayed, this is how they're intended to be put together, this is how he thought an individual should live life. So let me explain each one individually. First off, we have Night, Death, and the Devil. We see the knight on his horse, focused at the goal of reaching the city up in the mountains. The symbolic meaning of that city is heaven. The knight himself is victorious over his enemies, Death and the Devil. As the courageous knight moves past with his trusty dog, death holds the hourglass, and the horned beastly devil holds a weapon and looking to attack and take advantage of any slip-up that may occur along his life journey. The intention of this work in the Master Prince series is for individuals to recognize that they need to take action with focus as they travel through the world. Side note. The horse that's depicted was inspired by Leonardo da Vinci's Milan sculpture of a giant horse and his design for that. We see Saint Jerome hard at work. Within this etching there are all kinds of little details tucked away here and there to add elements of iconography and symbolic meanings in a deeper sense, which is very much a calling card of the Renaissance and the Renaissance art that was being produced at this time period. And the intended meaning that he had for this work was for the person going through life to think about sacred sorts of things and really be reflective of their own thoughts as they're going through life. And third is Melancholia One. We see the winged figure seated with their crown of buttercups and watercress in order to attract the sympathies of Jupiter. 
Throughout this work there are numbers and symbols and all kinds of things. Some of those are revolving around geometry, like the compass. Now, Melancholia 1 is a very, very deep picture that some might even say is an internal self-portrait of Durr himself. Melancholia 1 is really a theory of wellness that goes all the way back to ancient Greece. It was believed that the body has four fluids that needed to be balanced in the body. You had blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. You get cut, you bleed. You get a cold, you got snot and phlegm. You wake up in the morning, you got yellow bile that you urinate. And the black bile is melancholia. It was believed that this was a cause of depression, and if it got too extreme, you would end up with dementia. Now, there are three levels of melancholia. The most extreme was the theologians that had this very extreme intuitive thought. The middle level, level two, you had reason and science and physicians and that sort of thing. And at the lowest level is imagination and the artists. So here, Melancholia 1 is the first level, the level of artists of Melancholia. Each one of these different fluids was associated with different gods and symbols and all kinds of things. And Melancholia was associated with Saturn. And the best way to counterbalance Saturn was Jupiter. And so on the head of Melancholia, the winged angel, which is a bit androgynous, we see the buttercups and watercress wreath around their head. Again, a symbol that attracts, yep, Jupiter. On the wall, we see Jupiter's square, or the magic square, sometimes more commonly known as a talisman. And this is a series of numbers that left to right diagonal, they all add up to the same number. Now, this talisman equals 34. Now, why is 34 relevant? Because like Roman numerals, Hebrew letters also have a number value. And Jupiter equals 34. The four fluids, the four humors, the four seasons, everything is in balance, with an embedded counterbalance. The keys indicate power and order. The money bag is fairly self-explanatory. The dog is a symbol of fidelity. The physical symptom of melancholy is constipation, and so we see a device here used to relieve that. We see all sorts of woodworking tools and things like that, nails, saws hammer, crucible. The hourglass, as we've seen before, indicates a limited amount of time. The scales for judgment and the bell that rings to indicate the end of life. Let's take a break right now, though, and get to know our players a little bit better. Over his career, Durr would create over 200 woodcuts and 100 engravings, as well as many exceptional works in dry point and etchings in iron. Now, my personal favorite is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. But man, Durr made lots and lots and lots of different sorts of things from religious scenes to other sorts of graphics in various forms of print. And he was also very much influenced by the Portuguese folks that were bringing back treasures from India. As a matter of fact, they brought back a rhinoceros for King Manuel I. Now, Durr himself never saw the rhinoceros, but there was a German merchant in Lisbon that actually saw it and drew some sketches of it and told the story of the rhinoceros to Durr. And so Durr took his sketches and ideas and story and converted that into his own rendering, adding a few elements of armor and things like that. And that particular design would go on and he would make quite a bit of money selling prints and it would be used in textbooks as the example of a rhinoceros, even though it's not even really 100% accurate. The mother rhino is giving birth. Cool! Creativity was everything to Albrecht Durer. He would build a career and a name off of his prints. He was a pivotal artist in the publication and distribution of art, which had never really been done before. So the distribution of prints and artwork in a modern sort of way was founded by Albrecht Durer. He was the first celebrity artist that put his monogram stamped on everything. He became famous in his own time and without ever wavering, his fame and popularity continues to this day. Because you're like the coolest person I've ever met and, and you don't even have to try, you know? 
Stirrer was going on a trip to Zeeland, Germany to do a sketch of a dead whale when he caught a high fever and never really quite recovered from that. It is believed that he got some sort of malaria and battled through until his inevitable death at the age of 57 in 1528. You know, sometimes you eat the bar and sometimes, uh, you know. Durr would pass with a legacy and a fame and a popularity of his own time, and that popularity would continue to this day. He was, during his time, regarded as an exceptional artist, an artist who made his money selling his prints at fairs, and he knew that he would make his money and his name and his mark, and he developed that skill, and by God, he did it. And he did this through his own mechanism of what was right and what was wrong. And one of the pieces of advice that he provided to those going forward was, and since geometry is the right foundation of all painting, I've decided to teach its rudiments and principles to all youngsters eager for art. Yeah, that's right. Albrecht Durer said, if you want to learn art, you got to learn math. Go figure. Wow, I love telling you that story. Thanks for following along. Hopefully it was insightful. And uh, if there's other things that you'd like to explore, check down in the description. There's all kinds of content down there for you to peruse, as well as lots of other things that you can look at here on uh, the Mr. Burger channel. We will uh, get some more content rolling for you. And uh, we'll see you next time. You have a good day. Listen, I gotta go, but uh, I wanted to tell you that it's been educational. <laughs>